So one of the things I wanted to first dispel was just this notion of, oh, it's a write-off. Oh, you bought that car. It's a write-off. That's what a does funny that mean? word, isn't it? What, write-off what? Like People are like, oh, yeah, I just, yeah, okay. I guess he just got a Z06 for free because he wrote it off. People use that term as if you don't have to actually spend the money on the thing. <laughs> yeah. The government doesn't deliver a car to yeah. your driveway and say, yeah, yeah. here you go, bro. Here's, this is on us. Yeah. Or I would well, say even leasing, just better buy a car. Leasing versus buying a car with a low down payment still? Like, what if you finance the car, but you've got you know, thousand bucks down and, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, but a, a $60,000 car, if you do the math on what that payment would be at, say, 4% interest, it's going to be almost, not double, but a lot more than what the lease payment would right, be during right, that right. same period. Mm -hmm. Right. But your cumulative math, assuming that car lasts, mm -hmm. you're better off buying it. I 100% see yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Policy Genius. And if you know how life goes, then you know how important insurance can be. We pay hundreds of dollars a year to protect our homes, our cars, even our phones and electronics. But too many of us aren't taking the steps to protect our families finances. Mortgage payments, private student loans, and other types of debt don't just disappear if something happens to you. A life insurance policy can provide your loved ones with a financial cushion they can use to cover the costs, and it can provide you with peace of mind that even in a worst-case scenario, they'll be protected. And if you already have coverage through work, that's good, but having life insurance through your job may not be enough. Most people need up to 10 times more coverage to properly provide for their families, and coverage through work isn't portable. If you leave your job, the policy doesn't go with you, meaning a gap in coverage when you need it the most. And inflation is driving up prices right, for just about everything, right? But life insurance rates are actually down from this time last year. And since life insurance typically gets more expensive as you age, that means now is a great time to buy. By making it easy to compare your options from top companies, Policy Genius can help you make sure you're not paying a cent more than you have to for the coverage that you need. Policy Genius is an insurance marketplace that makes it easy to compare quotes from top companies like AIG and Prudential in one place to find your lowest price on insurance. And you could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Options start at just $17 per month for $500,000 worth of coverage. So just click the link in the description, head over to policygenius.com to get personalized quotes in minutes and find the right policy for your needs. The licensed agents at Policy Genius work for you, not the insurance company, so they're on hand throughout the entire process to help you understand your options so you can make decisions with confidence. Policy Genius doesn't add extra fees. They don't sell your information to third parties. They have thousands of five star reviews across Google and Trustpilot, and they've helped over 30 million people shop for insurance and placed over $150 billion in coverage. So head over to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. We're also brought to you in part today by Off the Record. Off the Record is an amazing service that works for you, helping prevent unnecessary fees, fines, and insurance rate hikes when you get a ticket. It is a team of people that can recommend and connect you directly with a qualified lawyer wherever you get a ticket who will fight that ticket on your behalf and keep those points off your record. They have an amazing success rate. They have... Uh, coverage in 97% of the areas where people live and where they drive, and they will ensure that you don't have to go to court wasting time, wasting money, missing work to fight a ticket. This ecosystem of fines and fees and insurance rate hikes is a racket, folks, and you want to stay out of it. Trust me, it's terrible. I have been there. Off the record works for you to get these points off of your record, saving you time, saving you money, saving you headaches, and just making your life better in general. Go to offtherecord.com slash TST or download the Off the Record app and use code TST10 
on that app. 10% off off the record services for life. It's great stuff, folks. Off the record.com slash TST or code TST10 on the Off the Record app. Get it now, make an account now. That way it's there when you need it and you don't have to worry and panic when you get pulled over. You've got a team working for you at Off the Record. All right, folks, on today's show, we heard from our social media people that you like to talk about money. And so that's what we're talking about. John McGuire is a tax attorney who is an automotive enthusiast. And we're going to talk about all the ways that you can save or waste money when it comes to buying a car. All those tax policies that can take advantage of you or that you can take advantage of when it comes to buying, leasing, or selling a car. It's a real interesting conversation with lots of practical knowledge. Tax accountant John McGuire today on the Smoking Tire podcast. Um, we had these uh, analysts analyze our show, mm -hmm. and they say, you know what does really well when you talk about money? You got to talk about money. Imagine that. I guess it's because people are seeking financial advice, mm -hmm. and we're not very good at giving it. So we brought you in to give some. And I'm happy to be here. John is a CPA. I'm a CPA. And a car enthusiast. Check. And you work with entrepreneurs and small businesses. Correct. Who need to write shit off and get creative legally mm -hmm. with their taxes. Yep. The better call Saul. If, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> And so we're going to try to figure out how one might be able to buy a nice car or a collector car or a sports mm -hmm. car and make it not uh, minimally, uh, uh, what? Expensive. Expensive. Yeah. That's the right yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. To leverage a tax deduction, maybe get some benefit right. to offset the cost. So one of the things I wanted to first dispel was just this notion of, Oh, it's a write-off. Oh, you bought that car. It's a write-off. That's what a does funny that mean? word, isn't it? What write-off? What? Like people are like, oh yeah, I just, yeah, okay. I guess he just got a Z06 for free because he wrote it off. People use that term as if you don't have to actually spend the money on the thing. <laughs> isn't that, the oh, government doesn't deliver a car to yeah. your driveway and say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. here you go, bro. Here's this is on us. Yeah. So, so what is a write-off? So it's a business deduction for a business purpose, right? right? So you spend money. It's about converting money that you're spending into a business deduction for a business purpose in the pursuit of generating income. Right? But also, yeah, the idea being that if you are the owner or part owner of a business, that if you could justify the business buying this vehicle, sure, then you spend the business's money on the vehicle as opposed to paying yourself, paying taxes on that income, and then spending your own money after taxes on this vehicle. That's the goal. Right. Exactly. Because if you're a relatively high earner, you're talking about 40, 50% of that money is gone before it even gets to your bank account. Exactly. So yeah. the way to think of it is instead of a write-off, oh, he gets a free car, it's you save your marginal tax rate on the vehicle. So right. it's essentially, I hate to use the term discount, because it's not really a discount, but you're getting money back in the form of a tax break. So if you're in the marginal rate of 32% federal, 9% state of California, that's 41%, you're getting like a 41% discount, assuming that the entire purchase price of the vehicle is deductible, yeah. meaning the entire car is used for business. So the business and personal use gets gets complicated because- But how, you, you declare what percentage is for each. Sure. And you're supposed to keep logs. Yeah. That's it's the thing. The mileage, right? And we'll get into ways to kind of protect yourself against the dreaded hobby loss classification. Mm -hmm. So keeping diligent records is, is everything, right? So you got to run, whether it's your side hustle or your main business, you got to run it like a business, like a professional, keep diligent records, get a bookkeeping software or hire somebody to do it. Bookkeepers are uh, very competent, aren't that expensive. Or if you're a DIYer, get a zero membership or What's Quick zero? It's Sound at like a QuickBooks. New Zealand company. Uh -huh. So it's like QuickBooks uh -huh. online. Oh. Um, it's kind of a Coke and Pepsi personal preference if you like zero or uh, QuickBooks online. Oh. It's a UX difference, okay. just depending on I what you want. But so, is it like, if you're literally keeping 
can you just keep a notepad in the car? Yeah. And go if you're miles school, zero I mean, to that thing is famous. So I would I would suggest doing that. You want to go home with one of these? I'll send you <laughs> sure, home. Sure, man. One. I would love it. You want a WCCS bullskin? Yeah. Skin? I mean, my handwriting sucks, but <laughs> yeah, I would love it. I go both sides of the page too. I fucking keep it going. Nice. This one started on April 9th, 2021. That was my first on this on this particular page. I love it. But I like to keep it old school. That's, so can you do that? That's pad, beautiful. Pad, net pad in the glove box? Yeah. And actually, IRS agents, God forbid you get in front of one and have to explain yourself, they actually like that as opposed to, here's a thumb drive with all my shit on it. And they're like, uh. So it makes it, it, makes it a little smoother if you're... And so... Mm. You know, Is that because they can see the change in ink over time? Yeah, well, or just, just like it's usually just written in like, oh, here's a list. Yeah, That's, and you know, you don't want to have to retroactively do it, make the note, but you know, try to keep up on it. But life happens, and all of a sudden, you're like, oh shit, I haven't kept my mileage log in like three months. What have I done? Yeah. So date, miles, and then a little business purpose. Saw Paul at whatever so and so company yeah. talked about. X. Um, yeah. Same with travel. So the IRS loves to audit for transportation expenses. So it's no, one of their number one audit items is transportation, travel, meals and entertainment, formerly meals and entertainment. Now it's just meals. They love to do it. Why? Because they have the data. They would audit people on, you know, their legal and professional expenses. They have a 11% success rate, let's say. But they audit people on travel expenses. It's like, oh, even 80% success uh -huh. rate and we recoup money. So what do you think they're going to do? They're so uh, thinly staffed right now and underfunded. Um, Is that because people are just trying to write off way too many things in terms of the amount of money and whatever they use it for? Is everyone just like, I'm just going to add it to this category. And then it's like, you should not be doing that. Sure. So people get lazy and just throw things into like miscellaneous. Right. Terrible idea. Um, and then the way it works, nobody knows exactly what the secret sauce of the IRS audit regime is, but things that will quote unquote flag their algorithm are Strip clubs. Strip clubs. No. <laughs> <laughs> what is this tuning? Uh, Lamborghini <laughs> Financial Services. Yeah. Is uh, expenses in excess of your gross income by a certain percentage? Oh, yeah. Like, like, uh, <laughs> or even just a certain percentage of your income, like more than ten percent. So these, they kind of get. So if flagged. you make a hundred grand a year on your payroll. De Correct. Declared. Sure. Just for for easy math. Sure. Sure. And there's a trip to Hawaii for twenty two thousand dollars. It's like it's well, probably going to get flagged. Right. Yeah. Again, it's it's uh, it's not a known exact science like the Coca Cola formula. No one knows exactly how it works. Or but that you, one's going to get. You make the same hundred grand a year, except and now you have a twenty eight hundred dollar a month lease payment for, for an sure. Audi R eight. Why? Yeah. Yeah. So so it gets flagged, and then a human will look at it, and then they decide whether or not to open up mm -hmm. uh, an inquiry. So to take it back to the cars and and the miles thing. Yeah. How, I mean, okay, you get, it's easy to say your pickup truck is for your contracting business. Totally. It's easy to say your uh, Escalade is for some livery business or a security company or something like of that. Of course. How do I, what, what can I do with an Audi R8 that is related Great. to an otherwise unrelated business? Yeah. Great question. So what you have to avoid is falling under what's called hobby loss rules. Internal Revenue Code Section 183 for any tax nerds out there. It's worth a look through if you're considering buying an R8 and deducting it, right? Just 20-minute read through. The reason I keep <laughs> saying Audi R8 is because there's a guy in my neighborhood who's you got an Audi R8, and it's wrapped in his weed company. <laughs> it's like the green fairy, yeah, you know, right. yeah. whatever. Advertising all the time. And that, and that so a is a definitely, you know, a better justification because the IRS would look at that and say, you know, it's advertising. He definitely has a stronger argument in mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm guessing that his tax repair is writing off that at 100%, even though he might be taking trips to Big Bear in it or whatever. Because you know, everywhere he trips. goes, he's But promoting. everywhere he goes, you know, and, and that's a little bit more of a commitment than putting on the little magnet that has like a little weed <laughs> pot leaf on it yeah, with, his, yeah, with yeah. his business. So, um, so yeah, if you're deducting something, you have to show a business purpose. There's not really so much about what it kind of car and you know, the price tag on it. It's really just, does it serve a business purpose? And 
can you justify the pursuit of income and not run afoul of these hobby loss rules? So the hobby loss rules are, there's nine criteria, but there's some main ones. So do you depend on this income? Is this income that is critical to your life? Or are you, you know, somebody who bought an R8 and you just put your Instagram handle in the rear quarter window, all of a sudden you're a professional. What if you no. bought what if you bought the same R8 mm -hmm. and you rent it out on Turo a couple of days a month? Totally. Then, but then you then you roll it. But th but then that would be just the allocation of percentage. So okay. it would be now here's the other thing. To take depreciation, we'll get we can get into this. Um, you have to use the vehicle more than 50% for business. Okay. Otherwise, you have to take standard mileage rate. Okay. Which is 58 and a half cents a mile. Just change to 62 and a half because gas got more expensive. Mm. Imagine that. So R8, you buy it, you depreciate it. You can take up to, depending on the gross vehicle weight, you can take a deduction of an R8 is probably not over 6,000 pounds. No, yeah, we, I, want the, I want to do the truck thing separately. The yeah. truck thing is a, is a separate For sure, thing. for sure. So you would deduct that, and again, getting back to the hobby loss rules, you have to show that the income's critical, that you are a professional or expert in the field that you're working in and need this car. So if you are, I'm going more to like the enthusiast. So mm -hmm. I bought an R8, I go to Cars and Coffee, I can deduct it because I get some influencer money on Instagram. It's like 500 bucks a month or 500 bucks a year. It's like, well, that's, does influencer money count? That's kind of a hobby, right? Right. But like, I'm, I could be an influencer. Yeah, like, but you're a professional. This is what you do okay. all day, every day. So, right, right. so someone, and not to pick on uh, employees of companies, but somebody who has a really hard time with this is someone who's an employee. Say you work at Yahoo. I'm not picking on Yahoo, but they're across the street. Yeah. So, um, you work at Yahoo, you're a W-2 employee, you buy an R8, you go to Cars and Coffee, you have an Insta Instagram following that generates minimal income, and you try to deduct your R8. That's going to get you no. in trouble. Right. Yeah. So audit rates are but really like, let's low. Let's say you're a small-time influencer. Let's say you actually are an yeah. influencer. Let's yeah. say you've got fifty to 100,000 people on Instagram. You do small-time uh, partnerships with brands and yeah. vitamins and what the fuck ever. And, 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 but, but you're spending a good portion of your time doing this. Maybe you have a day job, but you are spending a, a portion of your time being an influencer. And your car, whatever it is, is crucial to your in influencer persona. Then you're okay. Then you're okay. Uh, now, here's the other thing about hobby loss. You have to show profit in three out of five consecutive years. Oh. So if you show a bunch of losses, that's not a silver bullet, but that's one of their big criteria. If you're not showing profit in three out of five years, what are you doing? What if you've only been in business for two years? So that's fine because you've, because, you know, I'm sure a business such as this, big capital outlay, right, okay. it's, it's hard to get in the black in two years. So the IRS, you know, takes it with a grain of salt. But again, if you're Instagram influencer <coughs> and, and you have this big expense, yeah. you're probably you know, not going to get audited year one either. No, right? No. And it's, you know, they just don't want you to buy, they don't want your hobby to become an IRS, Buying subsidized cars. by the IRS. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you can show that you're an expert in the field, if you're losing money, but Hey, here are the steps I'm taking to get into the black and run your business like a business that yeah. gets back to the mileage log. Be an adult, be a professional, take notes, track your expenses. You don't want to show up to an IRS audit and be like, oh, here's a print out of my Amazon purchases and like this was for like show you up, like, prepare. Like make a bank account with a credit card 100%. for your car. Like, like or for your, the, just for the, your business yeah, that you're yeah, using yeah. the car with. One yeah. of the rental companies I used to work for, each, each car mm -hmm. had its own LLC. And That's every, fine. every expense associated with that car, whether it was fuel mm -hmm. or repairs or the rental income, yeah. would go through the LLC for that particular vehicle. For sure. Yeah. So LLC, we can talk about that, limited liability companies, not corporations as many people think, is a great thing to have because it perpetuates that argument of, hey, I'm running a business. I'm paying $800 a year to the state of California for the privilege of having this LLC. This is not me just like messing around trying to buy cars and, and write them off. So you set up an LLC, but the LLC in and of itself, I want to be very clear, same with any entity. There's no secret sauce. Oh, you get this Montana LLC and you can like buy anything and you just run it through there. And it's like, a, there's, no, there's no secret sauce to deducting a, a vehicle 
you know, in the gray area just by having an entity. Yeah. It, it shows that you have a business, and that's, again, a better argument than not, but it doesn't, in and of itself, it doesn't grant you well, wait, so, so let's go that. back to these nine things to avoid. So there's yeah. the three out of five years. Yeah, three out the, of five years. There's the, uh, you, you must rely on it. Yeah, right? depend on the income. Right. The other ones are you should have some expertise in the field. Expertise, okay, that's three. That you're taking steps to um, mitigate losses. Meaning, the so if you're if you're if you're not profitable in the first two years, or if you don't hit that three out of five uh-huh. year requirement, what steps are you taking to make your business profitable? And okay. if your business isn't profitable, what do you? Well, like, then it's a hobby. What do you? What are you doing? A business you that know? loses money. And is, this is really a hobby. started with like horse breeding and horse racing because that people would be like, and you know, collector cars is kind of in there too. So <laughs> you gotta be careful with just you know blatantly saying like. I got no net revenue, hundred and six thousand dollar deduction, and it's going to go offset my my wages from my job at Yahoo. It's like right, right, you're going right. to lose. Audit rates are around one percent, which is like crazy. You can't get odds that good in Vegas, but it's a it's around like what the fatality rate is for vehicles. Not to, not to make <laughs> Ironic, it morbid, but ironically, they're coincidentally the same. <laughs> but statistics are just statistics, right? So yeah. if you are statistics driving don't across if you, if the they six, draw you. yeah, if you're driving across <laughs> the Sixth Street Bridge at 100 miles an hour, pulling your e-brake, your odds are not one percent anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Or if you know you swim with sharks every day, your odds are are greater than the national average. Right. So things deducting large expenses like that will certainly bump your okay. exposure. What are the other ones? I think that's. I think we're on five. Oh God, you might have to pull do it up. Have, Section one eighty three. So there's um, requirements for, yeah, for hobby, hobby laws. loss rules. Yeah, hobby so, loss rules. So um, yeah, running it running it like a professional. Um, I can't remember all the ones that we've named so far, but. Uh, those are critical because if a hobby loss, if if you're fighting a hobby loss audit, the onus is on you. You're in the eyes of the IRS, you're usually guilty until you're proven innocent. Right. It's not like the the law. The yeah, yeah. Law, criminal it's not law. Not like the criminal law. Yeah. Do we have? Uh, that's we have Patreon questions. <laughs> we got. We'll get to those in a bit. Uh, activities not engaged in for, for profit. That yeah. sound right? Yeah. So that would be it. There should be a kind of a better. Oh, this is going to be like so fucking many pages. We can, that, that might be in a. Yeah. This we're trying. We're having you here to avoid reading that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so those are the main ones. Those right, are right, the right. ones that I think w- the an IRS auditor will refer to in trying to shoot down your argument of. But beyond that, it's not like certain vehicles are more heated than other vehicles. And like, let's say you're. Let's say you're business vehicle Mm -hmm. wasn't the our our audi r8 example let's Mm -hmm. say it was a 69 camaro and that 69 camaro required maintenance sure required upkeep sure maybe it maybe you wanted to do a full restoration or a build now what so that would all be added to the cost basis of the vehicle um, for depreciation purposes so vehicles have a depreciable life of five years you depreciate them over that period of time and sometimes longer. And then any of those expenses, we're getting into what's a depreciable item and what's an expense. So an expense is something that has a useful life less than one year. So okay. if I'm fixing this or adding that to the car, that's a repair that can be deducted in the current year at the percentage of business that you use the car mm-hmm. for. So if it's 80% for business, you get 80% of that deduction. If it's a, I'm gonna put a supercharger on there or I'm gonna do something that's more permanent for the car, that's a capital improvement to the car and has to be depreciated over its useful life. Mm. So you can't deduct that in a year. Now, there's section 179 deductions and bonus depreciation, but we'll get into that in terms of accelerated depreciation, how fast you can deduct something. So for now, instance- Now I'm a content creator. No, I'm, I'm not, I am, mm, but like yeah. the royal content creator. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm doing a project car for yeah. content. Yeah. Is that now a capital improvement, an expense, or a product, a video production expense? Good question. So I would say that it is, if you are a content creator, if you are using it to develop parts on, like let's say you're an aftermarket yeah, you're or something Holly like that. and you're designing a new supercharger. For sure, for sure. And that would likely be a... Um, 
a capital asset, but mm -hmm. you could depreciate the majority of it in year one, and we'll get into that, the bonus depreciation. Um, production expense would be more for if you are making like a more of a fictional film, more like what you had Ash in here talking mm -hmm. about, like if you bought a vehicle, like you know, made a vehicle like that or developed something like that, that's something that you could likely call a production expense. Otherwise, if the, if the asset itself has more than a one year useful life, you gotta capitalize it. But a, a average YouTuber doing an average project car build has mm -hmm. to go out and buy money for parts that then go into that car. How do we categorize that? Yeah, those would be capitalized. Okay. Mm -hmm. They'd have to be capitalized unless they're minor repair items if you're repairing something. So it's not, you can't say, well, I'm doing a video about putting new wheels on this car. Mm -hmm. So the new wheels are just a production expense for the video. It yeah. doesn't really work like that? No. That's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's exactly. bonus We're going to have to change our plans yeah. for the fall. <laughs> in section 179, and you can usually get 100%. Like right now, you can put a vehicle in service gross vehicle weight over 6,000 pounds, and you can deduct 100% of it. Yeah. But this is really good because I've I've been seeing on TikTok, there's like, there's really great CPA takedowns on TikTok of like, here's something that this person said, and boy, is it wrong. And then the, the example was a guy who is a small time influencer, has a job, and he bought a brand new truck. Mm. And his video was, look at all the things I'm able to write off, you guys can do this too. And of course the CPA was just like, mm, that's wrong. And then like the guy would keep talking, like that's wrong too. And it goes to this, where people think, that you can just buy a brand new truck or whatever, write mm -hmm. the whole thing off, yeah. and like you need to keep the mileage logs. Like you have to separate because if, if, you, if you use that truck for video, yeah. so you film film it twenty videos with it, mm -hmm. but then you also drive it to the lake to fuck around. Like you can't just There's business, you can't business write the whole use. thing off. And if you yeah. have an S corporation and you have the vehicle as an asset of that S corporation, you're technically supposed to include as a taxable fringe benefit in your wages from the S corp the personal use portion. Yeah, it's yeah. taxable income to you. Yeah. So, you know, if it's 25 grand a year you're spending in vehicle expenses and it's only 80% for for business, the other 20% has to show up in your W2 as taxable income. How many yeah. people are doing that? Mm. Not, not not many. A and a lot of people will just have a reimbursement plan through their corporation to pay them as a shareholder like yeah, $1,000 a month. Yeah, what can't your can't your company provide you a vehicle as part of compensation? Mm -hmm. They can, right? Mm -hmm. But you have to pay tax on that? You on the on the personal use portion. Now, it depends what kind of accountable plan you have, but typically the business, the the personal use portion is taxable. Okay. So you shouldn't so, be using the company car off the clock, essentially, in that yeah. in that scenario. But if you are the company, then it's then it's more convoluted, right? right? right. But you would have well, like if you're an employee of a company, mm -hmm. and and as part of your compensation, they go, we will provide you either a Ford Escape or a Toyota Rav Four or a Honda CRV, and you can choose which. But this is this is your car, and it's a lease, and you get, you know, the company owns it, but you're allowed, you know, fifteen thousand miles a year. If they're not, they're, I, I, in general, I assume the I assume assume mm. that 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 is then your car, and you can use it just as a car. And most of the time, you're going to the office and back, but sure. but you're also going to dinner, and you're all, also going to this. And are, do you think are you then required to keep those miles? No, you're not technically required. So depending on the accountable plan, you could have it so that um, it's a non-taxable fringe okay. benefit. So that's that's the best guidance is to just have a non a, a accountable plan that you draft up from the corporation. To okay. Yourself. So if and if you're in charge of the corporation, it makes certainly makes <laughs> that a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you give yourself shareholder an and R8. owner and employee. Right. Yeah. My Mach E, not a not a not part of my compensation. I just pay for that. Got it. Yeah. You lease it. I do. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't put a lot of thought into the best way. I probably could have justified it in a variety of ways that I'm not doing. Sure. But sure. Remember. Yeah, you do talk about it on the show. So I talk about it on the show content. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever. Maybe I could change it now. <laughs> um, Leases are tough because you there's not that big upfront depreciation cost, so you'd be able to deduct a portion of the lease right. cost itself. Yeah. Okay. So the six thousand pound thing. Mm -hmm. It ends up being talked about a bunch. Yeah. Um, but 
real quick, tell go go through how it works. And uh, yeah, so gross vehicle weight as opposed not to curb, curb weight as opposed to curb weight, two very different numbers. Um, so gross vehicle weight, a lot of crossovers will qualify on up. Um, you know, sports cars are tough because their gross vehicle weight is intentionally low. Curb yeah. weight's low, and then obviously they're not meant to, to carry a bunch of stuff. So but electric cars can get there. They're heavy. Electric cars Rivians are very are heavy. heavy. So, yeah. big batteries. So they're heavy. Um, so over 6,000 pounds. Which is a car mm-hmm. with full of passengers and luggage. And it'll say on the, on the exactly. door. Exactly. So it'll say right where your tire pressure should be. GVWR, right yeah. there on the... Right yeah, on the door pretty cell. binary. Mm-hmm. Over six, under six. Yeah. And it says what you can carry. Yeah. And so that number, if it exceeds 6,000 pounds, you're allowed to take a 100% bonus depreciation deduction for federal purposes. So folks in other states, check if your state conforms. However, federal is going to 80% starting in 2023. So it's dropping. I mean, I... So this, the way I understand it, this mm-hmm. rule goes back to the 1980s mm-hmm. when the Japanese auto manufacturers were making these really awesome smaller trucks. Yeah. And people started buying them instead of the bigger, mm-hmm. heavier American trucks. Yeah. And so the government wanted to juice the American truck industry sure. by creating an incentive to buy the bigger, heavier American trucks. Mm-hmm. Is that is that as you understand it? Accurate. Simplified but sure, accurate. Sure. Yeah. Um now in the era of we know what climate change is, um, the idea that you are incentivized to buy something bigger and heavier than you probably need is stupid as fuck. Yeah. It's crazy. And you you should buy a- be incentivized to buy something smaller and li- well, yeah. you should if they're giving out incentives, make it an incentive to buy a goddamn Prius. Well, and like so I, <laughs> I pulled this thing up which basically has the the cliff notes, but uh, a business vehicle under 6,000 pounds, you can only write off the first $18,000. Yeah. Correct. Like if you buy and, and this is amazing on this GMC website I found, like this is a dealership and they have the rule up there. It's like, "Hey, you can do this. And Remember you we saw the Range Rover one? It's like right here on this, I don't want to name the dealership, doesn't really matter. It's, it's, not, it's not they didn't make the law, but it's just so funny. It's an advertisement essentially yeah. for a big truck. It's like, hey, look at what you Deducted. can do with this. It's Deducted. incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. There was a Range Rover dealer that had basically that same page on their website. Sure. Did you know the new Range Rover can be duck deducted? Like and you don't think the car sales guys are talking about this when they're, they're pushing it? Know. Yeah. Like irregardless of being you know they're not a tax advisor so they're just like yeah you'll get it sure yeah. take it but um, you need to own a small business to do it right you need to own a small business you can't just be an employee of a company nope yeah. so unreimbursed employee expenses are no longer deductible federally mm-hmm. so and commuting mileage is not deductible too so that it would be a really hard argument again going back to the employee at yahoo example would be a really hard argument to say this is a business expense for right. me to buy this so i can commute to my job at at Yahoo. So, right. Um, still deductible for California unreimbursed employee expenses, but um, so but this it so you can buy any full size SUV. Mm-hmm. Many EVs. Many. Many many if not most mm-hmm. uh, EVs. Um, cuz almost almost any car that's over 4500 pounds and seats four people and holds luggage will have a gross vehicle weight. Yeah. It'll get it'll get there pretty yeah. close. Like a Model S for sure, a Lucid, 100%. you know, all of the Rivian is probably over that curb. 7, yeah, Rivian 7200 7, pounds <laughs> curb. <laughs> curb weight. Yeah. So 14,000 pounds just FYI is the is the upper bound to Okay. So, so if you buy a Top Kick then is then is your yeah. I mean, what's the Hummer EV way? Hummer EV is nine thousand at the curb. It's insane. Yeah, a couple of big boys in there. You're the, pushing they, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is the gro- Can you look up the gross vehicle weight of the Hummer EV? It's not going to be fourteen, but it's probably eleven five. Take or your buddies on a camping trip with 12, a bunch of shit in the back. Yeah, bunch ten, of beer ten, in the back. Five. Ten five. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> the cur- What insane. is the curb weight, Zach, of the Hummer H one wagon? I had a Hummer H1 wagon. It 
was the biggest shit box, <laughs> shit box on the you planet. You still see a lot of them on the road. Well, they're they're extremely collectible now. Yeah. And they're they will last a long yeah. time. I mean, it it was a shit box, but it's a shit box for life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Seventy one fifty four. Really? Mm -hmm. I thought it was heavier than that. Actually. Yeah. Well, and throw on top of that, you get the EV credit, right? So you buy right. a 7,200 pound Rivian, you get to take depreciation on it, and you get a $7,500 credit. Obviously, Tesla GM and now Toyota yeah. are out. But hot off the press, I don't know if we Why might... are Tesla, GM, and Toyota out? Because they sold taken... more than 200,000 units. Oh, right. Yeah, However, yeah. effective Ford probably in too. a week. Ford will be there soon as well. Yeah, soon. And Tesla, uh, Toyota, Lexus are phasing out. So starting October 1st, it goes to half, 3750. You get mm. 3750 and then and then what was that? September 30th of next year it'll be out out. But the law is changing. Inflationary Reduction Act is probably going to get passed within the next couple days. Mm -hmm. Pass the Senate, it's got to pass the House. Biden's going to sign it. Changes everything. So now there's income limitations. So do you want me to go over the old rules and then talk about the new ones? Uh, or just go into the new ones? Because this is most no. likely... Flip a coin. <laughs> this is most likely what's going to be passed. There's yeah. been many versions. The Build Back Better plan, that right. got shot down. But this one is like moving along and all the journalists are saying like, this is probably gonna, what's going to happen. So, because there's bipartisan support on the EV portion. So we'll just talk about the new one. So the new one is there's income limitations. So 300 grand of income for a married couple, 150 for a single filer or married filing separate. If you make more than that, you don't get a credit. Yeah. There's also a purchase price cap. So this is going to be big for say Rivian. So it's 55,000 for sedans. Again, this yeah. is effective starting January 1st, 2023. So I actually agree with this kind of stuff. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, don't it's think they're... crazy. My clients, you know, high net worth individuals getting 7,500 bucks yeah. for mm -hmm. the thing, buying a Taycan. Yeah. They're like, like, I'm going to take this to dinner. I'm going to hmm. spend this cash on yeah. dinner. And they're not like, you know, they're not going to say no because it's like, well, why? Well, you, you yeah, know, you why? don't say no, but it, but it, but, but it shouldn't be offered. It shouldn't be subsidized. Yeah, yeah, so, no, you should subsidize lower income people buying Priuses to buy efficient vehicles. Yes, and you should subsidize or uh, reward the manufacturers sure. for developing vehicles for those people right. to buy. Yeah, I try to yeah. stay out of the the world of shoulda, but I do, I do see the logic in in what you just said in terms yeah. of. Subsidizing people that actually—I mean, if you live in a world where if people will take maximal advantage of the tax mm -hmm. code, then the tax code should be written to help the people that need helping. That's, it shouldn't be written so that rich people can further subsidize their shit. Exactly. I mean, that's basically what the tax code is in a nutshell. Obviously, of income and expenses, it gets taxed, but what deductions? give you what tax benefit yeah. is really just like the, the government's way of subsidizing certain things like yeah. deducting mortgage interest is a great way to like help out the real estate market. So things like that. So yeah, what you subsidize has implications on. on yeah. There's no reason that we need to be subsidizing 6,000 pound gross vehicle. We, we Rockefellers are just small businesses. <laughs> yeah. I need some money from the government for this. Um, yeah. like, so 7,500 bucks <laughs> for vehicles. Uh, this is the new law. Um, it's it's bifurcated, so it's two components. It's three thousand seven hundred fifty dollars for if the if the battery was built or assembled in North America. Okay. It used to be U.S. and Canada and Mexico said, "Hang on, hang on, hang on." <laughs> so now it's North America. Was it Canada and Mexico, or was it the American auto manufacturers that had plants in Canada and Mexico? Well, yeah, of course, of <laughs> Pretty course. Pretty sure my Mach-E well, was built mostly. Sure, in Mexico. but those American, they would just relocate, which obviously right. is cost. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. you know, Canada's like, hey, hang on, hang on. Oh, that's a good point. It? Then people would just go across the border. Yeah, they'd be, yeah. Yeah. They'd be unemployed. Right. So, um, so that's one component, mm -hmm. and then the other component is the chemicals, the minerals that go into the battery have to be sourced from free trade agreement countries. Okay. So the Doesn't lithium, matter where the they're cobalt, from, as long as, it's, as long as we can't see them. As, uh, yeah. They must be sourced. We must have our dirty bits yeah. hidden away. <laughs> we cannot source from somewhere we have yeah. to live next to. Don't look over there. Yeah. Don't look at the boy digging out of the, the cave Oh, there the children some... love to dig. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. So, so that's a, a 40%. 
okay. of the minerals that go into the battery have to be sourced from a country of the free trade agreement with the okay. United States. And it increases 10% every year until it reaches, I think, 80% is the cap. And then same with the other I like how it never gets to 100. It's 50. <laughs> well, the, the, the built and assembled in Ameri- and in, the Uni- in North America does yeah. go to 100%. That's but it's f- like, it's not realistic for yeah. us to never use slave labor. <laughs> well, we're not but saying But we should just never. mostly not yeah. use slave labor. Yeah. 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 10% slave labor is okay. That's an ex- we've ex- that's we an could possibly threshold. guarantee yeah. that children aren't being used here. <laughs> yeah, we need to hedge ourselves. What's yeah. next? We change the Thirteenth Amendment? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. I think not. So, and then there's a used car. Oh, uh-huh. uh, so you can get four grand for oh. a used car. Is that new? New. I feel like any tax credit on a used car was is a good idea. But here's the crazy shit: the income limits are lower. You can only make seventy-five grand as a single person and one hundred and fifty grand as a married person. That makes no sense. Yeah, that doesn't. Oh, you're buying a used car. You you have to make less. It's like, well, yeah, I can only afford a used car because I like make less, and you're going to give me less of an incentive. So it's four grand or thirty percent of the, Mm -hmm. and the purchase price can only be twenty-five grand. Oh, and it has to be older than two, older than two years. Yeah, so you must buy a shit box, and it has to it be. Must, well, I ha- imagine they're they're going the newer the car, the cleaner it is. So that's what they want to incentivize. I guess. We know that's not it's not true because like if someone bought a five year old Prius, that's going to run cleaner than you know a brand new Camaro SS or something like yeah. that. Yeah, but yeah, you know, just for argument's sake, you can yeah. you can take the hundred percent deduction on a brand new twenty five hundred diesel, or but four yeah. grand off a used twenty five thousand dollar Prius. It's wild. So, and it has to be all done through a dealer. You can't do private party on the used car. Oh. And it's tracked by VIN. See? So you can only get it once, right? So you can't like. Oh, the keep car can it down. only be. Oh, On the see. used car, you can only get the four grand one time. You can't keep passing Wait, on. Wait, you as an individual or, or like, you know, if you buy. No you private buy a, party sales. Right. No private if party sales. If you buy a Prius from the dealership and then I buy that Prius later, no, that wouldn't work. Okay. No, what this is doing is this is going to bring used car inventory to the dealers. Mm-hmm. Because the because as we talked about with Bo mm-hmm. Bachman, the dealers are about to have a year where they have no cars. Yeah. This is this is coming. The 2020 end of lease yeah. thing is coming around and the dealers are going to have no cars. So they're trying to de-incentivize Person to person used EV yeah. sales. Right. And if you don't think somebody from the automotive lobby was looking over the shoulder yeah. of this thing like, being drafted, totally. I, I put it uh, put yeah. that there. So yeah, the franchise guy is, for sure. Is all over that. And then that. the seventy five hundred dollar credit that gets refunded at source at the dealership, as opposed to what it is now, which you oh. file on your tax return. You file a form eight nine thirty eight. So, so in term, so they literally will just whack seventy five hundred off the price, as opposed to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you don't okay. have to file a tax return and wait for the money and the whole thing. And so they can... Well, that's a, actually better. It's better. That's it's better. It's better. Saves us a tiny bit of work, but it's more just the person can realize the rebate like right away. It's not like this mail-in rebate that takes 12 months, essentially. Right. So. And the, so the tax credit is... Is it like... Does that mean it just like if you made $100,000 that year, for example, does that mean you're taxed at making $92,500? You're not handed $7,500. It comes off the price of the vehicle. It come, but, that's, but the way it was before it was non-refundable. No, no, no. no. Sorry. Like, uh, before, before, when you would file it with the, with the government, mm-hmm. would you physically get $7,500 back? Or you would just be taxed based on seventy five hundred dollars less income. I get the question. So, it would reduce your tax liability by seventy five hundred dollars. Right. And if your tax liability was zero, you get nothing. Right. You didn't get seventy five hundred dollars. So it's it was non refundable, which is some of the things that the dealer, the sales guys at the dealership. Oh, you'll get seventy five hundred bucks. Well, what if your liability is zero? You're yeah, you don't know shit. my tax liability. Now it's refundable. Okay. So you get it. At the dealership, well, doesn't matter. So if you that's don't have actually any. better. It is. Yeah. So if you, if you, again, it goes into the thing of like, well, you know, if somebody has all passive income and they don't have, you know, much, much tax liability, they still get seventy five hundred bucks. But, but it um, also helps a lot of other, you know, the couple sure. people that will have that are making their money for off sure. passive income, they get to take advantage of it. But other people, yeah, well, it'll help, right? And to Am go I getting yeah, that backwards. No, no, for sure. And then to go further down the rabbit hole, it's probably better for folks to have less financed, right? So if you buy a $50,000 car, right. now it's only 42.5, that's probably better than like 
getting this seventy five hundred dollar check next April, and you're like, shit, let's go to Hawaii. Yeah, it's like, mm, maybe that's you know, it's better to probably have that money right. reduced well, like, off, and of then the it comes off of your loan payment, payment, reduces all that stuff too. Sure, which yeah. we will get into yeah. loans, etc. But um, so that's the new bill. So another interesting component of it too is there's a transitionary period. So it's going to be signed into law any day now, maybe early next week. If it doesn't, boy, will this not age well. And so, yeah, right. <laughs> and so uh, there's a period where you can sign a binding contract if you have a vehicle on order and you want to qualify for the old rules. Oh. So Rivian order holders just got an email. I know this because I am one. Came in at one o'clock yesterday. It said, hey, if you want to make your $1,000 deposit, $100 of it non-refundable, you will be in a what's called a binding purchase agreement. Therefore, you can get the $7,500 based on the old rule. Because typically, it's when you place it in service, mm. when you take delivery of the vehicle right. is, the, is when you take the tax credit. However, there's a bit in the new legislation that says before the law is actually enacted, if you have an order and you make it binding, you're good uh -huh. for the old rules. So... So, be, so, so, so you're gonna go, you Fisker, gonna go for that? <laughs> I think so, and I'm on the old pricing for the. Oh Rivian, really? So they still haven't finished those deliveries. Like, the old pricing deliveries. Well, I got the the. I'm on the S. Oh, on okay, S. cool. So yeah, I already have a truck, so I want to get a the. Oh, you have a T already, and you're Sorry, gonna get an S. I have a truck, a oh. Tacoma, oh, okay. a, a, tr a pickup truck already. I see. But I'd like to get the. The well, Rivians homeless. are very nice. I, yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah, so it's fine. My brother-in-law works there, so go visit the a, Rivian hub while you're in town and learn to fucking compost <laughs> it's so weird take a gardening it's, class yeah, yeah. <laughs> you it's can. next to a public storage facility and across the street from like a homeless camp it's, very, it's really it's weird so LA. I love yeah it. I it's love the most it. LA yeah. thing ever <laughs> I know. the triangle of Rivian hub Air One grocery store yeah. and homeless encampment is all about 100 feet apart it's just like a it's crazy yeah. yeah welcome to Venice <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Venice is awesome. Yeah, that's where I live. Yeah. Um, it, it's an every day is a shit show. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so the tax credit though only applies to buying. Correct. You cannot take advantage of this if you lease the car. Correct. Lease which, stays with the dealer. Yeah. So now, I don't know if we want to get into the dealer this. take advantage of a tax credit if you lease the car. Hmm, know that. That's a good question. I don't know about that. I don't have any dealer Should ask clients. Bo about yeah, that. Ask Bo. Yeah, I mean, they buy it from the manufacturer. I don't know. I'm, I'm just making sure. Not. Yeah. Oh, the other thing about no, the new Ford Ford Credit owns my car, so I don't think yeah. that they I don't think they can credit themselves. Yeah. That doesn't work. The other thing about the new rule, no more two hundred thousand unit requirements. So Tesla's back in the game, oh, baby. So okay. they love that shit. So Tesla, GM, Toyota. It's like reset the clock. Got it. So that's pretty cool for them. Okay, but they're going to lose a lot of the high end buyers because they're just not going to get the they're not going to lose the buyers, but those buyers are going to lose the credit mm -hmm. because the income caps are low. So, buying versus leasing in general. Mm. Great question. How do you advise people on whether to I buy or lease? I think that's a little bit of a misnomer too. Everyone's like, "Oh, I just you know, it's a lease. I lease it through my business. I get way better tax benefit for that." Not really. Again, it goes back to the business use of the vehicle. So you're going to get the deduction for the business use. So the best option is to spend the least amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. So get a good lease deal or get a good purchase deal, compare the two, do your homework. Oftentimes leases are more expensive. Now there are cases, you know, they were leasing Nissan Leafs for like a hundred bucks a month kind right. of thing. And those Fiat yeah, 500 E's, it's just like 89 bucks a month, yeah. there you go. Well, so, so why do people, why does everyone say, oh, I, I, my, my business leases me a car? Do they, is that just what they tell themselves to drive? The business a new leases them the car, or they lease the car through their business. I think they lease the yeah. car through the business. So one benefit of of leasing is that it's lower cash out front, right? So you're mm -hmm. not buying a sixty thousand dollar car; you're making you know a four hundred fifty dollar a month payment for three years. Right. That's going to be less than sixty grand, guaranteed. However, when you turn that back in, you're kind of just getting right back in the loop and spending for because you need a car. Yeah. Assuming you need a car at the end of the three years. Yeah, you're making payments forever. Right? Yeah. So in for the long term, purchasing is usually better. The studies show that leasing a car is equivalent to buying, assuming you're leasing over a 10 year period or purchasing a car and having it for 10 years, over that 10 years, um, it's like purchasing a car at 14% interest. Whoa. Like, if and that's probably you, so, gone so, up because you've done three 
three year leases, right? Mm-hmm. Or or two and a half mm-hmm. 48 month leases yeah. over that same period of time. For sure. That's the equivalent of buying the same car, assuming you've leased the same car over and over. Mm-hmm. It's the equivalent of buying that same car at 14% interest when someone with decent credit could probably get something like. Well, it used to be two, two it used yeah. to be yeah. three. Now it's like five. Yeah. These cars is around seven. Yeah. I mean, the interest rate just got hiked two weeks ago. Right. By 75 basis points. Right, so, right, right. Um, so leasing is a way to hold on to your capital early on. So mm-hmm. if you're like starting a business, a lease might be good. So you're like, oh, I got to go out and buy a $60,000 car, but I'm also trying to, you know, run a restaurant or run, you know, X, Y, Z, run my contracting business. And so um, leasing can be beneficial from a cash outflow standpoint, but over the long term, once you start to become more profitable, better to buy a car. Or I would well, say even leasing, just better to buy a car. Leasing versus buying a car with a low down payment still? Like what if you finance the car, but you've got, you know, thousand bucks down and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, but a, thir- a $60,000 car, if you do the math on what that payment would be at say 4% interest, it's going to be almost not double, but a lot more than what the lease payment would right, be during right, that right. same period. Mm-hmm. Right. But your cumulative math, assuming that car lasts, mm-hmm. you're better off buying it. I 100% see yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, this, and you get those that, depreciation deductions we talked about. So. Yeah. Now, nice. what if you're an individual and you're not you're not uh, leasing through your business? Just, you know, John, Jane, whatever, they just, want, they just need a car. Does the same rule apply, buying versus leasing, buying for the long so term? So you're not using it as a business? Right. No, it's just your car. Um, then it just comes down to whatever the better deal is. Mm-hmm. What it, whatever's going to cost you the least amount of money over the long term. Of course, leases carry with them mileage restrictions. You can't modify it. You have to have mm-hmm. a certain level of insurance. Might be more expensive if it's a lease. You pay the that upfront down payment on a lease. I've always Do just done signing. the if you know you are going to want a new car in three years, just fucking lease it, give it back, and get something else. If you know you're going to want a new car. Because there can be headaches involved in buying, pay, making those payments sure. as if you own, and then selling it. You don't know, but I don't know. That's just well, laziness. There's a cost. There's a cost to that. Right. So I wouldn't call it a privilege, but there's a there's a premium to do that. Mm-hmm. To be like, all right, I'm done. You don't think the dealerships factor that in? Oh, they, like, I'm sure they do. Oh, you just want to be able to just drop it off to us? Cool. I mean, that's why you do a trade in. They give you like you know not the best rate, so you're always better off selling it private party, but you know, a lot of people don't like that. Yeah. They want to meet somebody in a parking lot and say, okay, let me take it for a drive, et cetera, et cetera. So they're just like, I'll either trade it in or in the case of a lease, I'll just give it back. Mm-hmm. So, and then the most expensive way to buy a car is lease, then lease buy the Lease, then buy it out. <laughs> well, actually, that's... Unless you get a great deal. Up until, mm-hmm. like, right now, that has been the most expensive way, mm-hmm. to, car, way to buy a car. But the, the number of people I know who have bought out their leases, even with having to pay California sales tax mm-hmm. when they buy it out, it's mm-hmm. 10, 10%. Mm-hmm. So whatever, they bought a car that was, f- or they leased a car that was 50 grand for three years. The residual is 29 grand to buy it out. They then had to pay the 29 grand plus $2,900 in sales tax. Yeah. They then took the car, drove it right up the street to CarMax, and we're offered 36 grand for it. Really? Uh, it's only in the last six months and only because of this car shortage. Shortage of used and cars. That they have been able to do that, which is part of the reason that I think both Tesla and Ford with the EVs are not allowing you to buy out your leases anymore. They're, you, they want to hang on to them. You can buy the car mm-hmm. in the beginning or you can lease the car, but mm-hmm. if you lease it, you can't, there's no buyout. Yeah. You got to give it back. So you're going to get that offer on your Mach-E or no? My Mach-E is from before they uh, did that. 2021 is, in. Yeah. Is, is before they made the They rule. want that inventory. They want the inventory they don't want to to and they Carvana don't want their whatever. fucking customers fucking capitalizing on the fact that the residual, the they real world that. residual yeah. is higher than the paper residual. For sure. Which is what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm, fuck it, I will yeah, if no, I can. Why not? Why not? Yeah. I'm an idiot not to. For sure. But I know I know a bunch of folks who've done this in the last six months. But it's contrary to the previous prevailing wisdom, and certainly not exclusive to leases. If Correct. you own, if you bought the car or finance it, you could still 
get more than you think. Yeah. But then you have to go back and get another car, and there's ADM on that. So it, it's not a therein t- lies the rub. Right. It works both ways. Right. In terms of shortage helps you with the premium of selling it, or but then you got to go around buy a new car. Yeah. Just like the housing market. Oh, I can sell my house for a bunch more, but unless you're willing to live in a tent or move exactly. east. Exactly. Significantly east, you're going to be right back in the same boat. You know, the desert is very, very nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was, a, I was in the car this morning with the uh, the the Ramats guy who's yeah. from Croatia, but yeah. has been all over America, and he was like, "Why does everybody keep talking about these people moving, leaving California, and and how it's a funny that people are not staying?" I go, I go, I don't know. I I, don't, I go, I'm okay with people leaving. It was getting crowded, and he goes, "I know." I. He goes, they're all saying everyone's moving to Phoenix and Texas, but I've been to Phoenix and Texas, and I don't know why you'd what? want to live there. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyway, yeah. No dispersion a, on those folks, but I know, your, I know your thoughts on Phoenix. <laughs> it's uh, not a place that I would oh, find it's myself terrible. living. Yeah. Oh, it's a terrible place. Yeah. Um, uh, how about in terms of investing in cars? Mm-hmm. Um. What what do you, what do you think is the 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 smart math on how much of your net worth hmm. should be in a car or a car collection, or for that matter, yeah. a watch collection or for sure an so, art collection? Yeah, for cars, I mean, you hear ten percent rule, ten percent of net worth. That's a common one. Now there's probably a lot of people going, "Fuck, man! Like, that's not gonna. How am I gonna get what I want? How am I gonna get my new manual Supra? Yeah, if uh, if I use that rule, so." You got to take a deep dive and look at your finances. I recommend people track their finances. Um, I've been doing it since college, mostly because I wanted to know what kind of shit I could buy and afford. <laughs> and uh, and just to see, you know, is this viable in my in my you know financial picture? Can I can I make this monthly payment? Can I buy the car cash and still be okay and still have an emergency fund for six to twelve months of expenses if I get laid off or my income goes? So, I would say from a um, you know asset allocation standpoint, ten percent of your net worth or twenty percent of your um, net monthly income. Okay. So for and that's for all automotive expenses. So if you're a married person, your spouse's car, if you're making payments on that, that's included too. Your insurance, your gas, all that stuff. 20% of your net after tax. Yeah. What am I putting in my bank account each month? That's but that doesn't count for retirement BMW contributions. Maintenance. That's different. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Okay. <laughs> so, and then the 10% rule, it's like, oh, gosh, it varies for individual, right? So if you don't travel, if you don't have a lot of other expenses, you know, let's say your house is paid off, things like that. It's like, Okay, you know, maybe you can bump that percentage up, but I would say, you know, t- between 10 and 20% is probably where you want to go, and then the 20% of income rule is is important too, unless you also have significant net worth and you can just buy the vehicle mm-hmm. in cash. So And and are you are you are you against the idea of financing fun cars? No. No, I think I think you can use financing as a tool. I wouldn't you know, again, if, if if the car is completely unnecessary to your lifestyle and you're going to take out debt at now five, six, seven percent, you really got to think about the what benefit that's going to provide you, how much enjoyment that's going to give you, because you're giving up a lot of opportunity costs. Yeah. Because you can take that money, that payment, and it could be paying a mortgage on a on a rental property that could actually like increase your net worth as opposed to decrease your net worth with a depreciable asset such as a car. So, and I get it's like, cars are fun. I love it. I mean, I, I love I love purchasing cars, but they're not the biggest return on investment, right? And there are certain cars, you know, on the, some on the can higher. Be. Some yeah. can be, but it's like. Yeah. Your red car is 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 one of those cars. Yeah, but even that's not without its. That's got operating costs. It's got operating yeah. costs. It's It's got insurance costs. I mean, I'll still do okay mm-hmm. even with those things, mm-hmm. but. Um, you know, there's there's opportunity cost to keep it here. Every sure. every space here is like fifteen thousand dollars that you're not that I'm not yeah. making. For you sure. know, so so um, in order to guarantee the kind of returns on a car, mm-hmm. there's very few like affordable cars where that is the kind of math you can do. It doesn't really for sure. And it's I mean. There is a system to what to buy and what, mm-hmm. but still, it's very, very tough. And like any asset class, it's also 
subject to different swings. So, like la- last year, last year and a half, people could have been financing fun cars and just yeah. going, man, everything's going up. Man, yeah. I can get a forty thousand dollars Porsche. That dude doesn't 60. know what he's talking about. Look at how much money I have, on, then, I have unrealized right, in gains right. in my in my car. And then but, March twenty twenty two shows up and it's like, oh shit, starting to flatten a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So cars are not the best place to invest your money, right? Because it is. There, it's the most one of the most fun places to put your money, but you can leverage, you know, in the instance of a rental property, you can put 20, 30 percent down on a property, and you get all the upside on the per, entire purchase price. But you're only you're only in it for 20, 30 percent now in terms of the cash. Obviously, you've taken out a loan for the rest, but you leverage that capital in a much greater way uh, with with purchasing real estate right yeah. so it's hard it's hard to make the argument that cars are a better investment than real estate or even just I, like I a, be a, tough a mutual make, fund yeah. or an index fund boring yeah. stuff like that no That's cars boring. aren't the best investment but what i do like about cars mm. is and i said this a bunch like you're not gonna find out that like the ceo was like a pedophile and the stock mm. just goes to straight to zero you know you're not gonna sure. find out that this this Stock boom yeah. is based on some technology that's totally fake. Totally, you know, like a Theranos or or oh full God. self-driving. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're not gonna. That's uh, why I invest like a 90 year old man. I'm just like index yeah. funds and mutual funds. And I do that exciting. stuff too. Yeah, but but small percentage at least in fun shit, Cars but. go up and cars go down. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, you can enjoy them. And if they do go down, they don't typically fall off a cliff. You know, 100%. immediately. So they're somewhat stable in that regard. Yeah, D- yeah. Depending on the car, right? If you buy a brand new RS6. Well, Avant, brand new cars. I I get asked about investing in brand new cars yeah. all the so fucking we should, time. Yeah, I guess we should be clear about like. I'm talk- I was talking yeah. about collector cars. Collector cars like, versus a The new number car. of people that ask me about mm-hmm. brand new cars and the long term value of a brand new car. And I just have to go, dude, I don't not fucking good. know. It's not good. Yeah. So yeah, in the case of the RS6, it's like, oh cool, it's got a you know twin turbo V8 and it makes all this power. Well, you know what else it makes? A shit ton of depreciation. Mm-hmm. It comes out both of those exhausts yeah. at the back. So you're there's lose. some that are better to predict than others. 911 GT cars, okay, very sure. short supply, sure, very tough to get. Mm-hmm. Those um, are the anomaly. Manual transmission Cadillacs, CT5 yeah. Blackwing, very tough to get great car history says those will probably mm-hmm. be okay i mean look at the wagons from yeah. 2012 yeah Things are fucking if you had if you bought one of those new you could have put fifty thousand yeah. free miles on it yeah and and got every dime back now so that's so that's the but thing they're few and far between mm-hmm. and they're pretty obvious when they're yeah when they present themselves they're pretty obvious well and it's nice to get to a spot where you have a, a garage with one car or four cars and they're not losing value they're just sitting there and they're kind of like locked in stone. So, but the and they they might outpace inflation maybe, but they're not going to they're not going to get you rich, but what they're going to let you do is park your money and have something that you can enjoy like the art on the wall or yeah. you know, an index fund doesn't give me any enjoyment. I don't right. look at that every day. <laughs> you have this like thing that's yeah. you know. And, and it's yeah. actually those those are almost like negative enjoyment. Like they go up, I I like yeah, of course they go up. I expected it to yeah. go up. That's why yeah. I bought it. But when it goes down, I'm like, "Fuck! <laughs> Wasn't supposed to go down." It's a one way street. You're like, "God, it's all the downside and yeah. the upside." Yeah, yeah. So I remember, I think it was on this podcast, you had Chris Harris, and he has his garage full of cars. He's like, "None of these are gonna go down. I can just keep these, and they're gonna not depreciate." So I'm at a point where and that's a that's a great place to be if you have cars that are just kind of gonna hold their value for the. For but the I think long term. to go back to what Matt said, a lot of that is. You buy it when it's near the bottom or at the bottom or just mm-hmm. depreciated. We, we don't know what the bottom is, but we get a lot of questions from people asking about, I'd say, fairly common mass produced cars that are cool, enthusiast things like, mm-hmm. oh, this G, you know, Mustang GT with Performance Pack 2. What if it's like the last good V8 thing? Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I got one of these, but should I drive it? And it's like, no, man. Like, that they made is too not many of them. Ta- right. They made way too yeah. many of them. I yeah. mean, again, there are anomalies. The new CTR, type, type R, might be like something that holds its value. Um, you know, GR Corolla, the, the like really limited production ones are probably going to be decent. But Did like, you see a, a Subaru l- STI 209 just sold for ninety thousand dollars on Bring a Trailer mm-hmm. because someone's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> I 
drove that car on the track. Like it handled I, very well. Yeah. But uh, it also, I got out of it going, this doesn't feel special enough. And I was sad as a Subaru fanboy. Mm. I was genuinely like, this does not feel special enough. Yeah. Definitely not for 90 grand either. No. It does not make sense. Well, when they decided not to make a new one, that made the value. Well, that's quite a, a bit. that's a. I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, it's if you got enough money and you really want an STI, and well, I, I've heard some of these Japanese collectors mm -hmm. that are Subaru enthusiasts are like real out of their mind and mm -hmm. will pay um, our friend, um, our friend Sean, who imports cars, yeah. also exports cars to Japan, and he said one of the things he exports the most of are nearly new STI wow. limited editions. I mean, I guess they're that's, very that's, popular you know, with Japanese collectors. I think about that every year. It's like, all right, this what car is now twenty five years old? It's going to mm -hmm. just be interesting to see all the the new cars. Yeah, no, we're 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 at a point where like most of the good one by by the middle of uh, twenty twenty five, mm -hmm. we'll be able to get like. Almost all the good shit. All the good shit. Yeah. Some of those early 2000s ones are just sweet. Yeah, there's cool stuff. Even like Hiluxes and stuff like that mm -hmm. would be dope to get over here. Mm -hmm. Certainly see a lot of those vans. Like Lunch. mine? Oh, yeah. The Delicas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. great. Yeah, they're they cool. fucking rule. I like this. Did you see mine? It was downstairs. I didn't see the it. The guys didn't take it. It's downstairs. No. Um, so the... Uh, where was I going with that? Don't remember. Can we talk about loan rollovers? There you yeah, go. Yeah, loan that, rollovers. That, that's huh. a big it's thing. A gr great way to get underwater. I hope you like to <laughs> swim. So, as the name implies, you roll your existing loan on a car into a, the purchase of a new one. It ties into the dealership where they're like, ah, don't worry, we'll take that other car off your hands. Don't worry about it. We got you. So, you know, you buy a $50,000 car, sales tax is fifty five. dollars a little fee, whatever. So you so you borrow fifty five thousand. Let's say you don't put anything down. You borrow fifty five thousand. You make your monthly payments. Two years later, you owe what forty grand on the car. Mm -hmm. Car's worth thirty five, thirty six. Let's say, then you're buying a new sixty thousand dollar car plus tax sixty six. But you still got, and they're going to give you instead of the car being it's worth thirty six, the old one. They're going to give you thirty for it. Right? Yeah. So you have you owe forty. You're getting thirty, so now instead of a sixty-six thousand dollar loan, you have a seventy-six thousand dollar loan. Mm -hmm. That sixty sixty thousand dollar car, seventy-six in loan, sixty thousand dollar car. You drive it off the lot. But it's they make worth fifty. It, but they make your monthly so, payments yeah. the same, just longer. Oh yeah, yeah. dude. So, ten years. Yeah, paid off in still, ten years. It's still seven fifty a month, but now instead of yeah sixty months, it's eighty four months. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot more and more of that. So what's the, the average, average now? Sixty nine, seventy two. I think it's seventy two. Wouldn't be surprised. And uh, and with interest rates going up, people are like, well, I can only afford $500 a month. Well, okay, cool. Here's a 108-month loan. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you throw Stop in the, the you know, vehicles with, with batteries that might not even last that long. You'd be right. paying the, yeah. a loan on a car whose battery might need to be replaced or yeah. something like that. Imagine that. And now, now it's out of warranty. Well, that's, the average for used cars is now 8.62%. That's high. That's, and that's then, yeah, 72 months. The average car loan length is 72. But that's, that's, I mean, average. So those people on the other side of that bell yeah. curve, on the yeah. far side of the yeah. hill that are stretching, you know, rolling things yeah, all dude, the time. Yeah, dude, that's crazy. So going back to the borrowing money to buy a car, I want to be clear. So if you're a, you know, a painter and you need a van, like, that's a lot different using finance to purchase a vehicle sure. versus like, you know, I need a new Z06 because it's fun as shit, mm -hmm. and I want to take out 150 grand in debt to buy it. I was I wasn't talking about someone buying a work truck for their yeah. manual labor business. That's it's not. That's almost I, like a piece of machine. That's right? yeah, yeah. That's just like a given. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know. And I and, just wanted to like reiterate that if there's yeah. some, you know, painter out there, he's like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? No, I get I get asked all the time about t going into debt for. Yeah. Car for sports cars yeah. and stuff that well, and a lot of people have a different appetite for debt, right? Yeah, I have clients that just like can't stand it. They'll pay off their mortgage even though they get tax benefit for the interest because they just don't like owing people money. So, yeah, but I think and then you have people on the other lot. side who are like, yeah. I rolled like I six loans. Fuck, I owe ninety grand to to BMW Financial, and my <sighs> you know old car is only worth forty grand now. It's like that's crazy. Doing awesome. Killing it. <laughs> That's crazy. Hopefully I die before this fucking pay balloon yeah, payment comes up. My heirs can deal with it. I mean, that's like a larger cultural problem is just Americans. We like yeah. debt, credit cards, everything. Just sure. doesn't matter what you're buying if it's a fucking pen yeah. or a car. It's like if you can't afford it, you can't afford it. But 
creative financing has found ways to let you afford that. And I think for that's a while. the the overarching theme is like you need to have the talk with yourself, put together a little Google spreadsheet and figure out like how much money's coming in, how much money's going out, and does this payment make sense? If it's more than your rent for your apartment or the same as your rent, you know, if you got to have that new M3, but your payment's going to be like 1600 bucks a month and you're I making 50, a, 60 yeah. grand, like someone's going to come with a tow truck and take that thing yeah. pretty soon. I talk to a lot of people who don't do out the total math. And that just They're like, I want to spend 400 a month. And I go, okay, mm-hmm. well, how much is your down payment? Yeah. Like, literally, like, okay, 4,000 plus mm-hmm. 400 times 48 wow. is this much. And I'm like, that's how much this is. Like, and they're just you're, like, you're oh, paying 50,000. Because, like, yeah. $500 a month sounds like it's just so different. That's like the, mm-hmm. the biggest, like, trick. Not that, you know, the dealers are entirely predatory, but that's like the whole thing where it's like, how much do you want to pay a month? How much can you afford a month? Yeah. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. How much car can I afford? It's yeah. not yeah, like, yeah. you know, 15 years paying off a loan. Yeah, if you chop that last word off that sentence, how much can you afford? It's, it's yeah. like a month, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, we got some questions for you on the Patreon. Sure. Patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast, of course. Ask questions of our guests. And while Zach pulls that up, I will have a little update. My car is on the boat. My Porsche has made it onto the boat. There was a dock worker strike I in heard. Germany, and tough to tough to mentally uh, mm-hmm. do that one because on the one hand, want my Porsche. On the yeah. other side, yeah. damn the man. I'm pro dock worker. Yeah, man, that's conflicting. So. I, you talked about you know, can I get, just still do the European delivery? <laughs> yeah. so can, can you just put it aside? Like, I'll fly over and get some it. like crabbing boat driving across the Atlantic yeah. with a fucking seven eighteen it's, it's spider on, the boat, on it. So. Cool, That's man. Good. good for you. You can have some frozen berry ice cream tonight. Celebrate. I'm going to eat the frozen berry fucking you. ice cream. Fuck yeah. Uh, anonymity says, uh, what happens to resale values of cars when brands give out manufacturer rebates? I was told that Subaru cars have higher resale values because Subaru does not give out manufacturer rebates. Is that true? Mm, good question. So, I don't actually know. I mean, I haven't heard of... How that would okay? So higher resale value because Subaru does not give. I mean, out if there's if there's rebates. never going to be a sale at the dealer, then okay. I suppose the it does yeah, help the used car values a bit. I would say yes. Um, I mean, Subarus in general tend to hold their value. I think it's more of a brand by brand thing as opposed to uh, necessarily rebate. And also, like, aren't rebates kind of a thing of the past now? You don't go and get a twenty five hundred. You know, truck I mean, and you get seven grand on the hood anymore. That's not happening. But I guess to their point, yes, because the actual like purchase price of the vehicle is not MSRP. I guess yeah. in the old days, like you know, you buy a seventy thousand dollar Silverado, you're paying like you know sixty two for it or something yeah. like that. So kind of the resale market is based on the sixty two, not the seventy. Right. So, but I would still think that. Yeah, if you're doing it relative to MSRP, I would say yes, this, the residual value of a, of a car from a manufacturer that does not offer rebates would be higher relative to its purchase price because um, but isn't you're that using that purchase price, not the reduced amount. Right, but isn't it almost like, okay, if I'm the first buyer and if I buy the car for 60 grand and then mm-hmm. I sell it for 40, use market, and then someone getting a competing brand, they get their car for 57.5 and then they sell it for $2,500 less than I sold, like, it's all relative. It's all relative, right? Yeah, you know, I, w- I would say it's- I'm it's, not winning because I got more residual value because mm-hmm. I didn't get a rebate because I just spent more upfront, basically. But I think what they're saying in your analogy is that they're using the MSRP to what the resale value is, not the reduced amount that you actually paid. So if you compare it to MSRP, but MSRP is like irrelevant if you're not paying it. It's really right. what percentage of the purchase price you're able to recoup when you resell it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't studied this issue, but I think- Subaru cars have higher resale values because they have insane brand loyalty. Oh my god! I mean, people Except who Except under the STI crowd. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, folks. I mean, despite the real, so you know, they have a few different reliability <laughs> issues, but in general, they're re- they are reliable cars. Yeah. And um, people who buy them tend to really like them. And they buy more. And they buy more. Yeah. Uh, Shucky Ducky Quack Quack. I like that username. Uh, I'm a recent CPA and work in tax uh, and in the public. Obvious advice for jumping to industry: How do I sell my experience? Mostly just deal with clients 
and do very simple accounting and bookkeeping. Oh, I mean the auto industry, be, industry or industry? No, no, I the... think like working for businesses instead of individuals. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of big businesses want you to have what's called the big four experience. So there's four major accounting firms. Um, there used to be seven, now they consolidated, there's four. So a lot of big businesses will want that big four experience. Not mandatory, I didn't do it. I sidestepped that, but I work in private practice. So if you're gonna go to industry, typically they want that. And typically you gotta start kind of at the bottom. So My friend worked at E&Y for uh, Ernst mm-hmm. & Young for three years. And man, was it a grinder. Like yeah. it was. They just, they grind you up and either yeah. you stay or you just get grounded. Yeah. Dust. And it's a good, like a system yeah. and you get promoted and all that stuff. Yeah. But it's but like, it's, a it's a fucking very, hard. very like defined system of yes. like weeding out. It's like buds for Navy SEALs. Yes. Yeah. That, that Except was a lot less cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David Zumont says, what made you decide to get your CPA and was it worth it or n- and necessary to get where you are today? Cool. Good question. Seems like David. you're kind of. It seems like you were into this. Yeah, so I dig it. I kind of took a backwards approach, kind of to piggyback on Shucky Ducky's question is, I didn't do the big four, so I got out of college with a marketing degree. And um, kind of had a glorified outside sales job, uh, and I worked with the accounting vertical market, so I met with a lot of CPAs, and um, eventually was convinced to join join the movement of CPAs uh, based on kind of their money and the lifestyle that they live. And so I was like, okay, cool. I'll do, th- I'll do this, <laughs> right? The glamorous lifestyle of a CPA. <laughs> the most honest shit I've heard in a long time. That was, I didn't know where you were going there. I thought you were like, no, I really like math and it's a system and it's very like objective and you're just like, they're yeah. making fucking loot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and if you're, yeah, if you got good math skills and you're decent with people, it's a, it's a great career. It's actually, they're hurting for people. The CPA industry is actually like starving for people coming into it. There's not as many people taking the exam um, and getting into accounting as there necessarily should be to be sustainable. There's a lot of folks retiring. A lot of boomers are like, yeah. I'm done with this shit. With all these tax law changes, 2018 was a big one, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and then there was all this yeah. PPP stuff. There's so many CPAs that are like 65, like I'm the fuck Boomers don't here. like learning So the things. demand is very high. <laughs> so that's my one PSA is like, if you're thinking about getting into the accounting world, um, and, and props to, to David, uh, or, or was it Shucky Ducky who became a CPA? Uh, uh, yeah, the last yeah. Yeah. props to him. Um, would, would you suggest uh, doing what you did, like finding a way into private practice and avoiding the big four? I mean, if I'm biased. In I think I think if you want to generalize and you don't necessarily know what you want to do, kind of like when you go to college, you'd go undecided. Like I would, I think the big four experience is is probably the best route because it gives you the most options because you're kind of like going through the hoops that you need to go to. It's a grind, so I've heard. It's gnarly. But that's the best way to to stay on the path. But, you know, I'm biased. I love private practice, and I'm glad I didn't have to go through that meat grinder. So who knows what I'd be doing if I had to go through that. So um, it was definitely worth it. It's uh, The quiz is hard. There's a very, very high fail rate CPA exam, but um, you can do it if you just apply yourself. Uh, Chris Navio says, currently Americans owe more than $1.2 trillion in auto loans because over the past decade, dealerships have made more money from financing than from car sales themselves. With no federal oversight, dealers can give a massive loan to someone with a bad credit score. Mm-hmm. Is this a bubble that will pop, resulting in car values dropping significantly? Fantastic question. So I've read quite a bit about this. There's a couple different things at play. So he's referring to the subprime car market, right? And you guys touched on it in one of your episodes about how repos are on the rise. And, you know, states like Mississippi, it's like one out of eight loans. Washington, D.C., it's one out of four. Yikes. Really? Default. One out of four? One out of four. And the reason is, to his point, is that part of what we're seeing a big bubble now is... Or, or a big repo right now is because all the COVID money's gone. Mm-hmm. People aren't getting unemployment anymore. They're not getting PPP loans for their business. They're not, you know, and so that's drying up. So if you look at what loans are defaulting, it's all the ones that were issued in like 2020 and 2021. And they're like, oh shit, I can't afford this anymore. So those are the ones that are getting pulled. So I would say that it's definitely, I mean, I hate to be hyperbolic and be like, it's a bubble, like the 2008 housing bubble. I don't think it'll be quite, quite that dramatic, but I think that there are a lot of repossessions coming and it is going to affect the used car market because it's actually going to create 
a situation where you have banks that own a lot of cars. And they already do. And they're yeah. actually controlling the flow of how many cars come out. Because if you're Bank of America and you got 5,000 cars in the LA area, you can't just put them you're all at auction at once. Dump them. Yeah, you, you want to 5,000 tr- Nissan Rogues at auction at once. It's like. Well, especially because right yeah. now we have a supply uh, yeah. glut, or not glut, whatever, a shortage. Shortage. So it's like they, they want to keep that price. Right, trickle high. it out, you keep know, the they price They love high. to. And then, you know, I found out that. Um, you know, a lot of companies are are owned by the same. So it's like Blue Book and some of the lending websites uh, are all owned by the same company. So they control like yeah, what course. the co- what they say is a great price. And it's and like it's Redfin like, buying all the houses. There's a little shit. asterisk. It's like great price does not actually mean a very yeah. good. <laughs> I know, yeah, right? for sure. Well, the for first sure. thing you learn when you I mean, whenever you deal with a car dealer is that yeah. like whatever Kelly Blue Book says doesn't mean doesn't fuck mean all. Doesn't mean shit. Dealers what have a willing own, buyer is willing to pay. Yeah, yeah, dealers have their own their own books. Um, so just want to follow up on Chris's question. So I I don't know if it'll pop. I would say it's definitely a thing. I don't think car values are going to drop as significantly as, say, housing prices did. Mm-hmm. In I imagine the supply shortage of cars will help stabilize it a bit, right? It'll like, stabilize. Let's say they repossessed everything. Yeah. But it's like, well, there's still people that need cars and dealerships yeah. are empty. But if they were full, then it would be a whole different it's, situation. It's a wild world because uh, the shortage may come to an end just as this bubbles pop. So it'll kind of be an in- interesting confluence yeah. of, of, of timing of how the supply. Uh, chain shortage affects this. Uh, well, maybe problem. the dealers will buy up all the cars because they're going to be fucking have no cars either. Yeah. So. Uh, William F. Kraft, what credit score should I have to finance my first new car? Well, if you're young, it's hard to have much of a credit score. You know, if you're out of college, good luck even getting a credit card with a $500 limit on mm-hmm. it. Um, but I would say, you know, I'm not a finance expert. I'm, you'd have to check with a bank. Um, which is another recommendation I would go to. Credit unions are the best. Mm-hmm. If you go in to buy a car and they say, we can get you 6%, it's like, well, who are you partnering with? Like, And you should always come in with some researched rates. So look at credit unions are awesome, PenFed, like your local credit unions, um, USAA, things like that will have typically better rates. And Dealerships are pretty good. I think like the predatory. Can you, can you go into a credit union with which you do not have a bank account yeah. and yeah. go, 100%. I'm interested in buying a car? Yeah. And I bought my Subaru like that. And, you did? and I got 1.5% uh, lower interest rate than the dealership was going to offer me. Oh, okay. So I just got my financing ahead of time and then went in and did that. Oh, okay. You can even refinance a car or take money out on a car that you already own outright. Don't recommend it. But if you needed an influx of cash, let's say... That and, seems and fucking you, dangerous, man. So if you have a you know fifty thousand dollar car, it's worth fifty thousand bucks, and it's and it's within a certain age. You yeah, know, it yeah. can't be like a ten year old car, but you can go and do essentially it's like a cash out refi on your mm. house. Again, do I advise it? No, unless you need a short term influx of cash, maybe for an emergency, and the rates are good. You know, like before it was like you could go in to PenFed with an existing car and say, hey, I want to refinance. Okay, 1.99% for 72 months. Here's a check for 50 grand. Like, not a bad thing if you needed the cash. And would you then you use the 50 grand, you'd your, buy off, you'd, buy, you'd pay out the existing loan and then have a loan back to PenFed? No, I'm saying if you own the car outright. Oh, if you, so you bought outright. the car oh, with right, cash. Right, 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 right. Okay. But now you want to... Yeah. Again, yeah, not yeah. advising this as a strategy to to, but if you needed if you needed to generate cash, you can typically mm-hmm. borrow on a car that Got you it. own. Just like you know, you can put. I you thought you were. T- I thought you said for a car that you like were still. No, no, no. no. So credit score wise, again, you'd have to check with a bank. I mean, what's good like six hundred and up? Probably. You know, again, if you're like don't own a house, if you're young, like it's hard to. Maybe if you have student loans, but it's like hard to to build it. It's kind of like job experience. You can't just like get it. Yeah. Equifax has a good quote, good credit score is 670 to 739. Yeah. Wow. So, and obviously interest rates are good. scaled That's, for. Doesn't that seem high for good? That says considered good, 740 to 799 are considered very good. 800 and up are considered excellent. Yeah. Well, and the but other big, ec- big you know, point ahead. here is that like, you know, a I great way to. 800 was perfect. Yeah. Like, can you even I, get higher than that? Is 800 not perfect? I don't know. And I also don't really trust Equifax for a variety <laughs> of reasons. Like, they benefit from raising the stakes oh, or the, the, the criteria. Yeah. So, of course. What it, can you, you just look real quick? Like, what is the highest possible credit score? Yeah. I thought 800 was perfect. 
I thought that was like a 1600 on the SATs. I think it's out of a possible 800. 850. Oh, really? 850? They, keep they just they're like, put fucking 50 points yeah. on top. To Some guy's like, God damn it, I'm not perfect anymore. I've done everything right, out. and I'm still not perfect. Fucking crazy. So, yeah, and a, and a great way to fuck up your credit score is to have your car repossessed, right? <laughs> yeah. Then you got to start at the bottom again. Yeah. So, what did you just find? You made a face uh, like you found something. Only one percent of the population can achieve a credit score of eight fifty, mm-hmm. according I'm to Moneyline. I'm shocked at that at that number. <laughs> just, I just thought it was funny. It's like, don't even try. But to the previous point, like we call them the one percenters. Actually. They're <laughs> lending people <laughs> monies with two hundred fifty credit score, no yeah, income yeah. verification. Yeah. So I think that's back to that question of two thousand eight bubble. It's a little reminiscent of that. Right. Oh, you got a heartbeat? Cool. Here's fifty grand. The subprime. Right. There's a great article on Jalopnik from I don't know, three years ago, maybe, but it was like the Nissan Sentra that has been bought and sold 16 times or something like that. And it yeah. tracked like the, the VIN records oh, of sad. this car and how many times it had been repoed, resold. And you know the amount of money that had been made over MSRP on this was just insane. That's sad. Yeah. And the tow truck driver that got paid every time to pick it up. Yeah, you know, it's brutal. That's an interesting Yikes. industry. I yeah. ship cars a lot. The car shipping industry is awfully fun. Wow. Yeah. Um, last one. So JJS here is giving us an anecdote on how rolling your loan over can work out. And I don't think this is a realistic expectation, even if even yeah, if, if you're his gonna story get 0%, is true. Gr- like, I had a high interest awesome. rate on my first car. After making payments, I was able to get a 0% loan on a new Explorer, and now I was paying no interest on that part of the old loan. I don't know. Are they? Is anyone doing 0% right now? No, but, let's just, but if we go back to three years ago when that was happening, so let's just say, if the, if the old interest is three percent higher than the new one, or three points higher, like, is this a common thing that he did? Or is this a good idea? Is this not a good if idea? If you can roll, I mean, I can't imagine a dealer. It's, I mean, this is this is true. This happened, but it's surprising that a dealer was able to get zero um, percent on the old loan. Like, oh yeah, we'll we'll extend you more credit. And you don't owe us any interest on it. That's just, Maybe that's they crazy. really had to make their monthly quota. Could be. You know, I mean, I got maybe. 0% on a Tacoma. I was going to buy it cash. and like, oh, we're doing 0% right now. I'm like, what? Yeah. That's unheard of that they do 0%. So I was like, okay, I'm going to pay you back in cheaper yeah. dollars, especially if inflation gonna, is coming. If someone's going to take your 4% yeah. loan and give you 0% on the new loan, that is yeah. a scenario in which it might make sense. Yes, I think so you have to look at all it's the still, fine print but it's still though. like the write-off. It's still real money. Mm-hmm. You still are widening your debt gap. Yeah, spending but, more money is not a way to increase your net wealth. Right. Uh, in, in this scenario. Right. You're right. Investing so in it's not. Things, it's but. it's like to go going back to the write-off thing. You yeah. still are going to pay more money. Sure. You're just going to be. And if something happens in your financial situation where you have to dump that car. You're underwater in a big way. Mm-hmm. So, but in but in the case of JJS, it's like, yeah, if you're paying zero percent on a loan, like you owed the money anyway. Like, yeah. So, y- y- great. Now you're having a lower interest rate, but we're not in a lower interest rate environment now. Right. Right. So, but, yeah, we don't know when this an happened. Anecdote, but correct. That is an anecdote where you are, uh, you know, paying less than you would have had you not right. rolled the loan into the yeah. Deal. But in general, not a good practice. No. Yeah. No, it's just a way to increase the gap between what yeah. you owe and what your car is worth, and then you're kind of digging yourself into a hole. Totally. $1,000 a month payment. Anything we go. missed? I think that's I think it. This relatively enlightening. Yeah. Enjoyed this I one. Yeah, this cool, I thought this Appreciate was very it. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming I'm happy down. to talk about finance. I know it's not everyone's like comfort zone to talk about it, so I'm happy to be that guy to yeah. put myself out there. And uh, yeah, I hope people take this to heart and keep an eye on their finances and do the right Everyone thing. Everyone should buy a 6,000 pound gross vehicle weight car. That's what we've learned today. Yeah. should all buy massive trucks. Like I didn't pay attention to any of this. I mean, I was 26, I bought an STI and like shouldn't have. And one of the biggest things for me is starting to pay attention, like you said, because we're not really taught financial literacy. No. In high school and stuff. No, that's and, a huge miss. Um, something I think about, it, I'm not trying to be disparaging to people, like when I go to Walmart or something mm-hmm. and I see like a 70 year old person working there, mm-hmm. you know, maybe their pension fell through. I don't know their story. Sure. I'm not trying to talk down to those people at all. Sure. Like I think paying attention to your finances now, depending on what you, whatever age you are, mm-hmm. can help you avoid having to work, you know, until you're 85 years old or, Absolutely. you know, just you can give you more options decisions. for later in life, mm-hmm. even though right now you really want to drive that new hot fast thing. So that's, that's what I think about. 
Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate to see even my own clients that don't really know how much money is coming in and don't really have much of an idea of what's coming out. That just like it blows my mind. I get that, you know, the business of people's business isn't ma- managing that. Maybe they have people for that or they're just not a numbers person. But I just like can't imagine not knowing like what's on a, on a general scale, like what's coming in or what's going out. Well, and you're going to find out sooner or later. Generally yeah. not under a good circumstance. Right. For sure. What yeah. you sure. find out is not going your, to be that your you're a multi-millionaire. Is like, uh, <laughs> yeah, your, our burn rate's like pretty fucking high. I work a lot of startups. It's wild. Oh, that to happened with uh, cash flow out Fast, flow. the payments processing thing. That was an amazing story. Yeah. Their burn rate was like. 30 million a month or some shit and That's no one insane. really noticed and all of a sudden the financing dried up when the market yeah. crashed and they were done in two there's months. no revenue they don't sell a product yep um yeah, yeah. That's, if you have a wild. business you should have some revenue <laughs> yeah. well and i have clients that you know they just no matter it's sad no matter how much money they make they they spend 120 percent of what they make that's crazy that's crazy. Because their income goes up, so their expenses. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Lifestyle. You gotta creep. get a, You gotta get your head around that and see what's going on. Because, like you said, you don't want to be working as a cashier at seventy. That's why it. it really helps to not to understand that you're not cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's nothing you can wear, yeah. buy, <laughs> go, or know where you can go that will make you cool. Yeah. If you just accept that, right? Your income can go up, and your spending won't. Yeah, very true. Exactly. Very true. And and you know another thing is to look at what that opportunity cost is for retirement. So if you have that money and you're putting it in something, mm-hmm. say eight hundred dollar a month payment on the M three, what that would be in like thirty years with compound interest. Dude, we're interest. so That's hard. Like, we're, uh, humans in general cannot. We don't like. We're not good at, at at that. I wish. There were I don't want to say all humans, but like it's really people. hard yeah. for me to do that mm-hmm. personally. I I've been taught to. And it's been drilled enough, and yeah. I, I just I give the money to the financial people. And they, but, like, when you can't see – it's the same thing with, like, smoking cigarettes or eating fast food. Sure. You know, it's Drinking hard. It's hard to you, – you eat a fucking cheeseburger now, and you don't feel like you've put on weight that day, but the cumulative effects, you know, and I have, I have, that, I have this problem with drinking wine. You know what sure. I mean? Like, I, the calories in wine, and, like – could drink a couple glasses of wine and I feel fine. But if I drink wine four or five days, yeah. I'm like, holy shit, this has gone badly. You know, same with that people say about exercise. It's like if you go to the gym and work out for four hours and you go home and look at the mirror, like probably nothing's changed. Right. But if you work out 20 minutes a day for like six months, yeah, you'll probably see something change. Yeah. But we're we're bad at at not having that instant grat, especially with cars yeah. where, mm-hmm. you know. If you can justify to yourself that mm-hmm. this car is an okay investment and money yeah. will come back on the other end. Well, you know, and not to not to contradict everything I said, I don't want to be like the want, want, don't buy a sports car because, like, I bought sports cars. I love them. Like, my M2, like, I fucking love that thing. So um, you only live once, and if, you, if it's within your means and it's not going to create a financial hardship, get the car you want. Just be aware of, like, you know, newer cars – will depreciate. Older yeah. cars will retain their value. Certain brands hold their values over other brands. So just, you know, be smart about it. Yeah. And don't spend all your money on don't it. Don't spend all your money on yeah. it. Yeah. Spend some of your money on it, not all your fucking money. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. This was interesting. Absolutely, Appreciate man. Happy it. to be here. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Yeah. Good times. Thanks for bringing us that uh, those bottles. Absolutely. And congrats on stuff. your uh, conversation with Gordon Murray. That was rad. Oh, yeah. That was a fun one. That cannot be understated. That was a very cool. That's like (laughs) a significant moment in like journalism, automotive journalism. And to get pick that guy's brain for an hour. Yes. And I have another hour because I have made an appointment with him to go over the nuts and bolts of the T50 at the Quail. So I can't wait for you to join. So we're going to do that. I know. I fucking can't. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, be giggling like a Batman villain. I hope all day yeah. he's just sitting there revving that thing like a little child. It's going to be <laughs> fucking great. <laughs> so yeah, like have fun at Pebble. Yeah, that'll be cool. That's going to be rad. Donnie put my seats in my car today and my door yeah. cards. Nice. What's, what's the over under on the 328 making it up and back? Oh, dude, it'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Cool. He does the, shake down, right? Dude, the car, when it was fucked, yeah. it never let me down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I drove it for months. In the fucked condition, and it was fine. <laughs> it's certainly not worse. 
Yeah, yeah. that's true. No, it'll be fine. Great. Yeah, and I'll he's gonna when he finishes it, he's gonna do like a hundred miles on it to make sure it's uh, it's good. And he treats be. cards like garbage when he drives them. Yeah. Donnie fucking beats the balls off anything he fucking drives. Torture tests it. So I when he gives it back to you, it's like I once brought him with me to pre-purchase inspection. I, I thought about buying a three fifty five, uh -huh. and he came with me uh, to to check it out. Yeah. And we ended up not there was. Every 355 on the planet needs 15 grand worth of something. Yeah. All of them. <laughs> and and in, in hindsight, what this guy wanted for the car plus 15 grand, I yeah. should have bought the goddamn car. But that being said, we took it for a drive, and Donnie's like, I'm driving. <laughs> and he fucking like, hammered this Hold thing. On. Yeah. Hammered it. Good. And the, the guy who we left at home was like, yeah, yeah. You heard the fucking thing screaming up the 110. <laughs> so yeah, he's gonna tell he'll stress test the car, yeah. and that's okay because if he breaks, it'll fix it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're get we're go we're getting a pebble in that bitch. Fuck yeah! Oh yeah! Fuck yeah! Dealer tags, baby. Got my dealer tags. That's awesome. We didn't talk about becoming a dealer as a. As a we as didn't, a, and there's also yeah some a whole apparent. It's issue a whole other thing. And self employment implications too. If you're holding vehicles for inventory and selling them, but what's taxable and if yeah, you pay. Yeah, that's highly the specific. Business of selling cars. Do like, your own. Do your own research on being a dealer. But for me. Yeah, becoming a dealer is a good idea. Um, good you. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate Absolutely. you coming down. Thanks to all you guys for listening. I hope you found that educational, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.